There's a wealth of information out there about goals and goal setting and goal achievement and so forth. There's comparatively little information that's been available to the public about the neuroscience of goal setting and goal achievement. So that's what we're going to focus on today. First of all, set goals that are challenging but possible. Those moderate goals, not super easy, not super difficult, but moderately challenging goals seem to be the most effective in moving people towards their goals over the short and long term. Second, plan concretely. You need a concrete set of actions that you're going to follow in order to reach your goals. Third, foreshadow failure. This is a somewhat surprising one to me. It turns out that imagining success and visualizing success can be useful at the outset of a goal and maybe every once in a while in pursuit of that goal, but that it's not terrific for putting you in constant pursuit of that goal. Rather, foreshadowing failure, visualizing failure and all the terrible things that it's going to bring seems to be more effective. And that maps very well to what's known about the neural circuitry and the involvement of the amygdala. Focus on particular visual points as a way to harness your attention and to remove distractors. Removing distractors and getting your body and brain into a mode of activation, getting that healthy increase in systolic blood pressure that puts you into forward motion towards your goals is absolutely key. I want to be sure to include a tool that's grounded in the neuroscience research and in the psychology research. This is something that I've personally been doing for many years based on my understanding of the visual system and the understanding that indeed we can move our cognition and our perception from a place of interoception and focusing on our peripersonal space, that space within us and immediately around us, and on the things that are immediately accessible to us, that we can shift from that mode to this mode of exteroception of focusing on things outside the confines of our skin and that are beyond our reach, that are literally goal-directed behaviors and goal-directed thoughts. So I'm gonna first describe the tool and then I will explain more about the underlying science and the underlying mechanism. Here's how you would do this. You could do this indoors or outdoors, although ideally you would do it in a location where you could view a horizon. It could be through a window or ideally outdoors without a window. It could be done any time of day. At night, it might be a little more challenging, but it goes the following way. What you first do is you would close your eyes. This could be done seated or standing, but you would close your eyes and you would focus as much of your attention, including your visual attention, on your inner landscape, on your interoception. So that would be your breathing, your heart rate, maybe even the surface of your skin, but really focusing internally. Now, how can you focus your visual attention internally if your eyes are closed? Well, you do that by imagining your inner landscape, okay? So you don't have to imagine your heart beating and so forth, but what you're trying to do is eliminate perception of the outside world. You're eliminating exteroception and you're focusing all of your cognitive attention and your perceptual attention on what you're experiencing within the confines of your skin or at the level of the surface of your skin and inside your body. And you would do that for a duration of approximately three slow breaths, okay? So close your eyes, you would do breath one, breath two, and breath three, concentrating all your attention on your internal landscape. Then you would open your eyes and you would focus your visual attention on some area on the surface of your body. So for me, the way that I typically do this will be to focus on, say, the palm of my hand. So I'll focus my visual attention on the palm of my hand. And I then do three breaths again, focusing on my internal state, but now I'm splitting out a little bit of my attention from interoception to exteroception. I'm focusing on something outside me. The ratio or the split of attention is about 90-10. About 90% of my attention is focused internally, but I'm also focusing some of my attention externally. Most people can do this pretty easily. Then there's a third, what I call station. I now move my visual attention to outside my body, to some location in the room, or if I'm outside in the external environment, something in the range of five to 15 feet away. And I'm trying to move 90% of my attention to that external object. So now I'm really biasing my perception and my attention towards exteroception. As I breathe, I'm paying attention to those three breaths. So that's why there's still 10% that's focused on my internal landscape because I want to pay attention to those three breaths, but I'm focusing as much of my attention as outside of myself, maintaining just a little bit on my internal state so I can measure the cadence of those three breaths. Then I move my visual attention to yet another station, which is further away, typically a horizon or something as far off in the distance as I can possibly see, again, for the duration of three breaths. And at that point, I'm trying my very best to move 99, if not 100% of my attention to that external location. And then what I typically will do is I will try and expand both my vision 
and my cognition to a much broader sphere. This is that magnocellular vision that we talked about before, where I'm not focusing on a particular location on the horizon. I'm trying to dilate the aperture of my field of view so I can see as much of the visual landscape as I'm in as possible. If you're in an internal... Um, if, excuse me, if you're in indoors, then that might be the ceiling, the walls, and the floor of the environment you're in. If you're outdoors, it would be to expand your visual focus as broadly as you possibly can, again, for the duration of three breaths. Then I would return immediately to my internal landscape. I would close my eyes and I would do three more breaths, focusing entirely on my interoception, on my internal landscape, or what we called before my peripersonal space. And I would then repeat that peripersonal space, 100%. Focused on my hand, 90%, 10% on my peripersonal space or my internal landscape. Stepping out to another location where it's mostly exteroception, maybe a little bit of, of recognition of my internal state. Then to the horizon, then to this broader visual sphere, then back into my body. And I would work through each of those stations maybe two or three times. The entire thing takes about 90 seconds to three minutes, depending on how many breaths you do. I said three, but you could do one or 10. It doesn't really matter. The visual system is not just about analyzing space. It's actually how we batch time. It's how we carve up time. And the simple way to state this is that when we focus our visual attention on a very narrow point that's close to our body and our immediate experience, we tend to slice up time very finely. We're focused on our breathing. We're focused on our heartbeats. In fact, our breathing and our internal landscape and our heartbeats become the sort of second hand, if you will, on our experience. We are carving up time according to our immediate physiological experience. Whereas when we focus our visual attention outside our body, not only do we engage that exteroceptive, extrapersonal space system and we start to engage the dopamine system, the goal-directed system, but we also start batching time differently. When we focus our visual system into a broader sphere of space or into a space beyond the confines of our skin, we start carving up time, our frame rate changes. Now, this is useful in the context of goal setting, goal assessment, and goal pursuit, because with the exception of a very few isolated examples, almost all goals involve setting some goal that's off in the future, and then carving up the time between now and the achievement of that goal into milestones that range in duration. And the rewards, even if we try and just make them every week, are going to come at some unexpected intervals. And that's actually can be helpful for reinforcing behavior. Intermittent reward that's intermittent and random is the most effective reward schedule we know. But the problem is always, how do we keep our cognition in line with the long-term goal while also being focused on these more immediate goals? And so this particular practice is teaching us to use our visual system and thereby our cognitive system and thereby our reward systems to orient to different locations in space and therefore different locations in time. And that is the essence of goal-directed behavior. That is the essence of setting a goal. It's about thinking about what you want. Then it's about setting milestones that are intermediate to that goal. Then it's about assessing whether or not you're reaching those milestones. And then it's, of course, about updating your goals if you need to update your goals. All of that is an enormously confusing batch of challenges if you think about it all at once. But if you break it down into these elements that the visual system can help you find and move towards those milestones, I think there's ample evidence to support that. And that your control over your visual system is indeed yours, that you can deliberately set it to different locations. And then you make a practice of stepping through these different stations on a regular basis. Again, I do this each morning. I do this once a day. Rarely have I done it twice a day. Rarely have I missed a day. But by doing that, you can be very effective in teaching the systems of your brain that are related to goal setting and reward to map to different timeframes. 